donkey, Mr. Bush. As Latin American leaders march forward, unified against a military coup of a past era, and determined to transform the continent, the Obama administration is forced to play catch up. We seek an equal partnership with a suspicious neighbor haunted by a bloody and bitter past. Is it all rhetoric, or are the Americas at the dawn of a new era? This is Empire. Hello and welcome to Empire. I am Marwan Bishara. The overwhelming condemnation of the Honduran military coup by all American nations, from Canada to Argentina, signals a dramatic departure of two centuries of Southern disunity and Western interference in a continent marked by oppressive military juntas, despicable dictatorships, and gross violations of human rights. The rise of a new Latin America was further reinforced by President Obama's vocal admiration of progressive Latin American reformers and his willingness to engage left-leaning leaders like Chavez, Correa, Morales, Ortega, and Zelaya, as well as Cuba's Castro, all opposed to the United States' neoliberal and imperial policies in the region. Over the next hour, I'll be discussing the evolving inter-American relationships with the eminent professor and leading American intellectual Noam Chomsky and debate the most pronounced alternative regional projects with Latin American scholars, author and academic Celia Zisterman, Andres Mejia Acosta of the Institute of Development Studies, and Roberto Mangabera Unger, former Brazilian Minister of Strategic Affairs and advisor to President Lula. But first, Al Jazeera's Latin American Bureau Chief, Lucia Newman, reports on the geopolitical implications of the Honduran military coup. When Honduras's left-wing president, Manuel Zelaya, was unceremoniously overthrown in a military coup and sent into exile wearing only his pajamas, something happened that would have been unimaginable just a few years ago. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, all of us have great concerns about what's taking place there. Uh, President Zelaya uh, was democratically elected. What you see here is Latin America forthcoming, Latin America united, decisively against a coup d'etat, and the United States having to react to that fact. And in the end... We have joined all the countries in the region. Joining Latin America, but not leading Latin America. It was a very different picture the last time, during the foiled military-backed coup attempt against Venezuela's president, Hugo Chavez, which the White House initially backed, publicly and behind the scenes. It's no secret that President Chavez has had a rule that has been controversial and has not met with widespread popular support within Venezuela or with among, among his neighbors and certainly in the United States with President Bush. The United States learned from the mistake it made on April 12, 2002, when it failed to immediately denounce the coup against President Chavez. <laughs> Twenty years ago, the president that occupied the palace you see behind me agreed to send Argentine troops to the other side of the world, to Iraq, to ingratiate himself with President George Bush Sr. during the Gulf War. Then, after 9-11, Honduras and El Salvador agreed to do exactly the same thing. Today, it's hard to imagine any Latin American country agreeing to serve U.S. interests in this way. Obviously, uh, the U.S. still has a policy uh, of empire in, in the hemisphere, but it's lost enormous power in the last uh, decade. The unilateral uh, terms of, of uh, this neo-empire, in a way, uh, of, the, of, the, of the global empire, was a major failure. El Señor Obama. Such a failure that the White House was forced to look on as Latin America formally welcomed communist Cuba back into the fold, lifting Cuba's long suspension from the Organization of American States, 
despite Washington's objections. In the last decade, the political and economic map of the region has changed radically. Latin America's new center-left to far-left-wing governments have rejected the U.S. model of free market economics. They've found new options for economic partnerships with China, Russia, India, and Europe. What's made the biggest difference is the consolidation of an economic and politically stable bloc that includes Chile, Uruguay, and Mexico, and is led by the region's powerhouse, Brazil. Brazil is a great South American interlocutor and the leader of a new South America and without any doubt a global actor in this new world scenario. For the first time in history, the United States is having to really listen to Brazil and to a lesser extent to Mexico, which along with Argentina now form part of the G20 group. I believe the most decisive moment of this transition is the recognition by the United States uh, that it does not have the influence it used to have. Los Estados Unidos. Latin America nevertheless has high hopes for U.S. President Barack Obama. Trust has to be earned over time. While the United States has done much to promote peace and prosperity in the hemisphere, we have at times been disengaged, and at times we've sought to dictate our terms. But while he seems willing to dialogue condemning the overthrow of Honduras's democratically elected president. The coup uh, was not legal. Many in the and region that, say his secretary of state, Hillary Clinton, was reluctant to even call the coup a coup. I conveyed uh, our deep regret over the tragic events uh, that unfolded uh, in the last uh, days. The rules of the game have changed, and nobody in the administration could openly support the coup, as they would have maybe uh, five or ten years ago. But uh, the support within the institutions here in Washington for that coup government are still very strong, just as strong as they've uh, been in the past. Latin America has seen a change in concepts and words coming from the U.S. president. But what is still pending is a new, real dialogue that proves with actions that the United States and Latin America really can turn a new page. Professor Chomsky, welcome to Empire. Glad to be with you. Let's start with the last month uh, since the military coup in Honduras. Some claim that the Obama administration's response has been spot on, simple condemnation. Others say it has been dragging its feet. What's your evaluation of, the, uh, of Washington's response? Uh, well, it's different than in the past. Uh, this is the third military coup in, in the new century. Uh, the first one in 2002 in Venezuela. Uh, the U.S. openly supported it. The second one in uh, Haiti, uh, the U.S. and France carried it out. Uh, this time, and this is unusual, the U.S. has not uh, condoned it. It followed the lead of the Organization of American States. They took a strong stand against the coup. The European Union took a strong stand, and Obama took a later and a milder stand. So yes, the Obama administration has followed along behind uh, the Latin American countries and uh, several European countries, uh, which is unusual, and it's followed along um, tepidly, not very enthusiastically. You've written a book in the 1980s about uh, America's involvement in Central America by the name of Turning the Tide. Do you think, judging from Latin America's response uh, to uh, the question of Honduras, that the tide has changed in favor of Latin America? Well, the Latin American countries are now feel uh, more independent of the United States. In the 1980s, the uh, U.S.-backed, U.S.-installed dictatorships began to crumble. Uh, popular movements began to develop, and it's changed uh, the tenor of Latin American affairs. Also, the international scene has changed. Uh, there are South-South relations developing. U.S.-Latin uh, American relations with the European Union are increasing. Uh, new entry into the scene is China. And that gives that along, crucially, with internal developments in Latin America, part of them just the undermining of the dictatorships, uh, partly a, a reaction to the catastrophic effect of the neoliberal programs that the U.S. Uh, uh, imposed through the IMF. Uh, 
uh, th these have uh, just given uh, Latin Americans uh, a, a lot more opportunities. Last September was a striking case. There was violence in Bolivia, uh, an effort to, on the part of the old elites, the Europeanized, mostly white elites, to separate themselves from the country because uh, they don't like the uh, democratic election that uh, brought indigenous people to power. And it led to violence. There were dozens of peasants being killed. And there was a meeting of UNASUR in Chile, uh, which came out with a strong statement uh, supporting Bolivian President Evo Morales. And in response to that statement, he said something significant. He said, uh, this is the first time in 500 years that uh, the South America is uh, coming together to solve its own problems uh, without the uh, overriding uh, control or influence of foreign powers in recent years. One of the most outspoken uh, Latin or Central American leaders, Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, has spoken elaborately and praisingly of your book, Hegemony and Survival, a couple of years ago. Let's listen in first. Hegemonia or supervivencia? Hegemony or survival? The imperialist strategy of the United States. It's an excellent work to help us understand what's been happening throughout the world in the 20th century and what's happening now and the greatest threat looming over our planet, the hegemonistic pretensions of the American empire. Professor Chomsky, what do you think the likes of President Chavez or the Alba states, or for that matter, the Rio group in Latin America should do about the organization of American states or uh, that organization being used as an arm of U.S. diplomacy? They're part of the organization of American states. They're a dissident part, and I think they should remain within it and influence it. And in fact, uh, it's no longer true as it had been that the organization of American states is simply an instrument of U.S. policy. So take, say, the case of Cuba. Uh, when uh, John F. Kennedy, the early 60s, uh, wanted uh, to, the Latin American states to join him in uh, expelling Cuba and ostracizing Cuba, they almost all went along, not be necessarily because they wanted to, but uh, the dictatorships, of course, wanted to, but uh, because the uh, arm of the U.S. was a little too frightening. They didn't want to challenge it. In fact, I think the only country that didn't go along willingly was Mexico. Uh, when uh, Kennedy tried to convince the uh, Mexican prime minister that uh, Cuba was a threat to the hemisphere, um, he responded that uh, I can't go back to Mexico and tell people that Cuba is a threat to the hemisphere or 40 million Amer uh, Mexicans will die laughing. Well, that was unusual at the time. Uh, now it's changed. But do you think that that change uh, is simply a change from hard power empire to soft power empire? I mean, doesn't the United States still exercise huge influence over the economies of Latin America? It has enormous influence, but it is uh, declining. Uh, so the U.S. has had two major weapons to control Latin America as far back as you want to go. Uh, one is military force. Uh, the other is uh, economic uh, warfare, and both weapons have been weakened. Uh, it is continuing to, in fact, expanding its uh, uh, military presence in Latin America, but the weapon is much weaker despite the two, two coups I mentioned in the, two, in the year 2000. Uh, also, the economic weapon is weakened. Uh, the economic weapon was, uh, uh, the instrument of it in recent years, the neoliberal years, has been the International Monetary Fund, which is basically a branch of the U.S. Treasury. And that was able to impose uh, neoliberal measures, which had an extremely harmful effect. But now uh, quite a number of the countries have, the major ones, have essentially thrown out the IMF, and they're pursuing a somewhat more independent path. Also, uh, uh, Latin America, for the first time in, since the Spanish and Portuguese conquests, has begun to move towards integration. The Latin American states were quite separate from one another. Uh, they're, they're, the, they're also, they have a sharp internal split, uh, probably the biggest uh, inequality in the world, small 
Europeanized elite has run the country, is super rich, a huge mass of poor, suffering people. And the elites were oriented towards Europe or later the United States. Uh, they had no responsibility to the country. Well, that's being to some extent overcome, and the countries are also becoming more integrated. And it's showing up in policy. President Obama uh, went to Trinidad and told the Latin American leaders that he's not interested really much in the past. He wants to talk about the future. I want to talk to you about that, but first let's look at what mm -hmm. Tim Tate summarized to us as Americans' intervention in Central Latin America. For almost two centuries, the United States has intervened brutally in the affairs of its neighbors in Central and South America. The United States will be willing to acknowledge past errors where those errors have been made. The U.S. president has promised to clean up the historic mess in his own backyard. The United States policy should not be interference in other countries. But can a leopard really change its spots? We supported some of the worst dictators the world has ever known. The United States uh, will continue to intervene in countries when it feels its uh, national interests are under threat. The last military coup that had the U.S. presidential seal of approval was against democratically elected Hugo Chavez. El golpe de this coup d'etat was not designed in Venezuela. It was designed in Washington. The United States openly supported military uh, takeovers if, if the civilian administration seemed to be uh, pursuing policies that were opposed to those of U interests of U.S. investors or perceptions of U.S. national security. Since the end of World War II, the United States has attacked, invaded, or supported coups in almost every country of Central and South America. Washington favored military regimes in Latin America because they could be bribed and they could be affected to conform with U.S. policy. And the results have been more of the same. Repression, torture, and blood on the streets. Ever since Columbus, the Spanish and Portuguese thought it was their God-given right to plunder the Americas. When US President James Monroe announced the American continent for the Americans, it was a rallying cry to get rid of European influence. The Monroe Doctrine claimed to protect Latin American countries, newly independent from the European powers, but the Latin Americans hadn't asked for this. This was a unilateral action by the United States. The United States interpreted the doctrine as giving them dominion over all the Americas. President Roosevelt in 1904 issued what was called the Roosevelt Corollary, in which he argued that Latin American countries weren't able to put their own house in order, then it was up to the United States to take responsibility and intervene and set things right. Under the guise of free market capitalism, Washington went to war in Central America, setting up banana republics in various countries to protect their profits. But the Cold War saw commercial interests replaced by ideological. In Cuba, U.S. leaders were prepared to go nuclear to stop communism gaining a foothold in Uncle Sam's backyard. The revolution of 1959 was such a shock, and uh, it was a very dramatic uh, manifestation of a real security challenge. And the U.S. administrations then and later were absolutely dedicated to preventing any subsequent Cubas even if it meant trampling on democratic niceties in the process. Then came the era of the juntas, of torture, death squads and mass murder. And many of the perpetrators were US trained. The School of the Americas was a military training program. Some graduates of the school went on to quite nefarious uh, careers and led coups or led uh, human rights violation campaigns in their domestic countries, and therefore the School of the Americas got a very bad reputation. In the past decade, a so-called pink tide has swept through the region. In election after election, voters have turned to candidates who oppose Washington's way. Three quarters of the continent's 350 million people now have left-leaning governments. 
most of the countries of South America have voted for uh, leaders and governments that oppose U.S. intervention in Latin America. Not just Venezuela with Hugo Chavez, but the only countries that really now we can count on are Colombia, where we give more than a billion dollars of aid every year, and Peru, where we enabled uh, President Garcia to become elected with mass amounts of aid. For the sake of North and South American relations, the United States needs to make friends, not just speeches. To move forward, we cannot let ourselves be prisoners of past disagreements. Professor Chomsky, I would like to ask you, I've heard all, all uh, President Obama's speeches in Africa, in Ghana, as well as in Cairo to the Muslim world. In Latin America, he seems to be the least apologetic for what America done in Latin America. Do you think it's time for an American apology to Latin America? Not simply an apology and not simply the United States. The imperial powers should not only apologize for hundreds of years of miserable crimes, but they should also do something about it. Meaning uh, compensation? They, yeah, reparations. And when you carry out major crimes, uh, you should uh, 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 offer reparations. In many of your books, you seem to have poured cold water on Roosevelt's good neighbor policy. And many are uh, saying that President Obama is pursuing more or less the same thing, except in this case, there are no client states in Central and Latin America rather than independent sovereign uh, states. So is he taking the right path? I think he's taking the path that any American president must take, given the realities of the situation. When he says we should forget the past and look toward the future, uh, that's uh, you know, it's like Britain telling India or Italy telling Libya, let's forget the past and look toward the future. Uh, it's easy to say that if you're strong and powerful. It's not a wise choice for the weak. Uh, but the United States does not have the options it had in the past. But do you think... Uh, it's still overwhelmingly powerful. But if you look at the America's relationship, North and South, uh, do you think they are a microcosm of more of the same around the world or throughout the empire, as it were, for the United States and the West in the Third World? Well, you know, about uh, 30 years ago in the 1970s, uh, the world began a very clear uh, development towards what's sometimes called a tripolar system, uh, three major centers of uh, economic power, only one center of military power. Uh, the, uh, North America, uh, Europe, comparable to the United States economically, and uh, East Asia, Northeast Asia. Well, that's been continuing. In fact, other, there are other entries. Uh, there are now, for example, relations between uh, uh, Brazil and uh, China, Brazil and South Africa, Brazil and India, uh, Peru and uh, China. The, the world is becoming more diverse in the uh, distribution of power. Now, there's one dimension in which the U.S. is totally supreme. Uh, that's military power. So no other country has uh, hundreds of military bases around the world. Uh, U.S. military expenditures are almost as great as the rest of the world combined, much more advanced as the military f fighting wars all over. That's unique. Professor Chomsky, we're running out of time. I just wanted to ask you, being a leading linguist, among other things, do you think it's about time that uh, we no longer use the word America for the USA. We shouldn't use it, and Latin Americans don't like it at all. There's a kind of a linguistic problem. Uh, you can't make an adjective in English out of the phrase United States. You can in Spanish, but you can't in English. So we so have you to can't say American. Say he's a United Statesian. No. Well, there's no other word. You can't say North American, because that includes Canada and now technically Mexico. What about Latin America, Professor Chomsky? Yeah, I mean, is that also a fair characterization? The term Latin? Of the, yes. Well, you may recall that uh, uh, George Bush the first, his vice presidential candidate, Dan Quayle, uh, when he visited Latin America for the first time, he apologized uh, to the people that he couldn't speak their language because he hadn't studied Latin in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Professor no, Chomsky, on that <laughs> note, I must thank you. We're run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us at Empire. We must break for news. But when we come back, I will discuss with our guests Latin America's responses to its northern neighbor and whether the continent's leading leaders are acting wisely or recklessly.
to attain continental stability and unity right after the break.